Welcome to the Reef Resilience Webinar, Sustaining Fisheries Through Collaborative Approaches. My name is Petra McGowan, and I'm the Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Program. I'm the host for the session. The webinar is brought to you through the generous support of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. So today we have two great speakers. Carmen Ravenga is a senior scientist at the Nature Conservancy, and she leads the Sustainable Fisheries Global Priority. She has more than 15 years of experience working on linking science and policy to improve the management of marine fisheries and freshwater resources. She's also been involved in multiple global assessments, including the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the World Water Development Report, and the 2010 Biodiversity Indicators Partnership. Our second speaker is Stephen Victor. He's the Deputy Director of Conservation at the Nature Conservancy's Micronesia Program. Stephen is a native of Palau and plays a leading role for the Micronesia program through developing and, and managing cutting-edge projects on fisheries, marine protected area network design, management, and effectiveness evaluations. Stephen also plans and leads learning exchanges between fishermen and conservation practitioners to facilitate sharing of lessons learned in Micronesia. Before coming to TNC in 2009, Stephen was a researcher at the Plow International Coral Reef Center. So I'm very excited to have our speakers here today. But before I start, I wanted to share some quick information on how the webinar is going to work. We're going to begin the webinar with presentations from the panelists, and we'll end with questions from those of you participating. There are two ways you can ask questions. Use the question box at any time throughout the webinar to send questions, and we're going to keep track of them for the end of the session. Raise your hand during the question portion of the webinar, and I'll take your question during that time. Sorry, there's a lot of noise. I got a little distracted. <laughs> so um, you can raise your hand by clicking the small hand icon on the toolbar at the left of the list of attendees. If you're having any technical difficulties, trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can also send a question and let us know so we can try and resolve the issue. So before I hand it over to our panelists, we always like to get an idea of who's on the phone with us today. So we have a quick poll for you. So please let us know what sector do you work in. Um, you can click your, your poll and tell us if you're with government, nonprofit, private, academia, or something else. Um, our panelists are just curious who's who's on the line today. So we'll give you a second to answer that. And then, all right. So Carmen and Stephen, you can see we've got a lot of fellow NGOers on the phone, but also a mix of folks from other places. So we're excited to have you guys here. And I'm going to hand it over to Carmen for the first presentation. Great. Thank you, Petra. And welcome, everyone. I hope you can all see this screen well and can hear me well. Um, so as Petra said, I'm Carmen. I'm the lead for the fisheries priority for the Nature Conservancy. And I'm going to give you an overview of what we're doing in fisheries um, all over the world. And, and then Stephen is going to get into more detail about what we're doing in Palau, specifically with data for stock assessment. Um, so with that, um, Cherry, can I have the next slide? One of the questions I get asked a lot is, why is the Nature Conservancy working in fisheries? And for you in this audience, it probably makes a lot of sense. But other audiences out there don't quite uh, always think that this is an area we should work in. But basically, what I always say is that we've become really good at finding and catching fish. And so good in the fact that 85% of all marine fisheries are either depleted or fish or fish at their biological limit. And that means that if any excess effort or added effort into a fishery would probably um, move those fully fish fisheries into a state of overfishing. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, when you look at historical data on global fish catch, um, it was doing really, really well for many years. Uh, but around the late 1980s, it seems to be stuck at around 82 million metric tons. And since then, it's, it's been going down, even though the most recent report from the Food and Agriculture Organization does see some recovery. 
um, but those, those recoveries have been seen mostly in northern hemisphere with larger fisheries. Uh, next slide. When we look at both the large scale fisheries, kind of the you know, industrial fisheries, and the small scale fisheries, they're both on a declining trend and away from, from the ideal sustainability target. Um, our work at the Nature Conservancy really puts an emphasis on the small scale fisheries. As you can see in this graph, they're in much worse condition. And these are the fisheries that are most prevalent in the developing world, especially around coral reef areas. So that's where we're trying to put a lot of our work into. Um, next slide. So why, broadly why we're in this situation in most places of the world, um, even though it varies from place to place, there's some consistent things that have made fisheries such um, so overexploited. The main one for us is that most of them are still managed under an open access regime with very little control on effort. Um, there's a lot of excess capacity. Uh, it's estimated that there's 40% more boats out there that we need to, to catch the fish we catch today. So we got rid of 40% of the boats in the world, we probably get the same amount of fish. Uh, there's very little regulation and enforcement, or even if countries have good regulations on the books, they're very, very hard to enforce because of lack of resources by most governments. Um, and at the same time, the gears uh, that we're using tend to impact habitat or, they, or tend to be gears that catch a lot of juvenile fish, which just makes the problem worse. In the northern hemisphere, it's mostly a lot of trawlers, but in the developing world, it's mostly gillnets that cause a lot of this harm. There are also very high levels of bycatch, even though this is not as relevant in small-scale fisheries in, in the tropics, because most of the fish that caught is used, and there's very little trash fish. Uh, but overall, this mismanagement and lack of management is costing the sector about $50 billion a year. So there's a lot of interest from governments and the industry to really do something about it. Next slide. So at the Nature Conservancy, what we want to do is reverse this trend. We, we want to obviously increase fish, fish yields, but we're also concerned with the livelihoods of the coastal communities that depend on them, um, and with the food supply, and also with the conservation of habitat. So pretty much we want it all. We want more fish, more jobs, more stable jobs for fishermen, more seafood, and healthy oceans. Um, and for this, we have a five Strong strategy. I'm going to have the next slide, please. Um, but our focus is mostly on the supply of sustainable fish. A lot of groups have been working for a while on creating the demand for sustainable harvested fish. So you see a lot of work working with retailers. Um, but even though there's enough demand out there, the supply is really not available. And we do think that, at least for the Nature Conservancy and for what is needed in the small-scale coastal fisheries, like around coral reefs, what we need to focus is on the supply, and then really moving a lot of these data for fisheries into some sort of rights based management. And we do think that you can do that in partnership with the fishermen, sometimes with industry, and of course working hand in hand with governments. Next slide. So I'm going to go through these one by one, but basically it doesn't matter where we work, all our projects have these five common elements, and is what we're calling our, our strategic approach. And the first one is to really work hand in hand with fishermen to encourage them to really be the force for finding reform. Um, the Nature Conservancy is also a very science based organization, so we're trying to use that to inform management. Um, you can't work in fisheries without working with policy and governments. And then the last two are more kind of innovative ways that the Conservancy is trying to accelerate reform. So I'm going to start with the first one, if I can have the next slide. And this is what we really put a lot of emphasis in. Uh, almost all our projects, uh, the, the main point is to have these agreements with fishermen and, and make fishermen kind of be the leaders on coming up with a model that can work. In some places, like in Indonesia, we are working with smaller communities in the Lesser Sunda regions and trying to help them organize as fishing associations so they can have more voice in this arena and start implementing 
uh, better best practices. In other places like Chile, where fishing associations already exist, we're trying to help those fishing associations um, be more organized, uh, employ you know different types of practices that they haven't done in the past, but also you know link them to markets and things like that. But our our main goal is that we want these fishing communities to be engaged and to be kind of at the center of their form. The next slide. We're also putting a lot of emphasis on the science for data for stock assessment that Stephen is going to talk in more detail after I'm done. And this is because 80% of the global catch comes from these fisheries where there's very little information. And without that information, it's very hard to set management rules. Um, the way we're, we're working with the fishermen is that you engage them in the data collection process that you need to assess the stocks. And that helps them get buying into the management reforms that then we're proposing to solve the problem. So this has been a very successful in Palau, and Stephen is going to spend some time talking about this. Next slide. And as I mentioned, it's very hard to really work with a public good like fisheries when you don't have a, a framework for policy. So while a lot of countries have good policies on the books, a lot of them are not very enforced, but there's also a lot of times, especially in small scale fisheries where you know, establishing access rights to fisheries is quite difficult, but you do need that legal base and that, and that regulation behind it. So we're working very closely in all the countries that we are with the government to try and have the enabling conditions that support this reform we're proposing. In the next slide, please. Um, because you know, governments are slow to change, uh, we've also discovered that by working with the private sector, sometimes you can accelerate reform. Um, the government is more risk averse to trying new things. The industry sometimes is more willing to try something. Uh, so we are using this partnership with the private sector, and here are two companies we're partnering with, uh, NORPAC, we're partnering in Indonesia, and Shellcatch in Chile. And basically they're either buyers or processors of fish, and they're committed to sustainability, and they are willing to work with the fishermen and with us to find a way where they can meet sustainable targets, but still get you know, their fish to market. Um, and it's it's been interesting. Once you have the private sector on your side, it's also the government is more willing to observe. And then if it sees it works, they're more willing to help you accelerate those reforms. So it's kind of a, sometimes we use it as a carrot to get the government interest in it. In uh, another part, we also are working on is creating these sustainable finance vehicles that will finance reform efforts in the long run because, of course, there are expenses and most governments don't have the, the resources to really put this in place. So we're looking into different vehicles, finance vehicles like debt for adaptation swaps. Uh, we're working on one in Belize, and we have others in the Seychelles, uh, and we're trying to think of potential ones in the Pacific as well. Next slide. And finally, we're pioneering with new technologies. We're finding that there is a demand for sustainable caught seafood, or at least to know where your seafood comes from. And even though that's more prevalent in Europe and in North America, we're finding in some countries there's also a, a local market demand. Um, so we're using these technologies. They're usually traceable lake technologies, like NORPAC has their own. Shelf Catch has developed one for small-scale fisheries. And we're putting them to the test in, these, in the fisheries where we work and linking the information from the traceability to the market, finding new buyers, and providing an access to market for the small-scale fisheries. Most of them are very hard to access things like the Marine Stewardship Council. You need a lot of resources to do that and a lot of data. So we're finding that this type of technology can facilitate that approach and can also bring new markets and new and better prices to the fish and the work with. Next slide. So this is a representation of the places where we are. You can see that you can't read all the names, but <laughs> we're in a, mostly in, in the U.S. and Chile and the Caribbean, in Peru, in Mexico, in the Cold Triangle, Micronesia, Melanesia, 
and the Western Indian Ocean. So we're trying to scale up this strategy to all these places. We have a lot of partners, and we're always looking for new partners. Um, so I think this gives you a kind of a brief overview of what we're doing. And Stephen, I'm going to pass it on to you so that you can get more into the details, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Stephen, are you not hearing you? There we go. Okay. Ah. Hey, everyone. Sorry about that. My name is uh, Stephen Victor. I'm going to give you a presentation on uh, fishermen led reforms uh, in, in below on coastal fisheries using data poor stock assessment. Uh, next slide, please. So the outline of the presentation will uh, I'll uh, provide a little bit of background on uh, fisheries and management in Palau, give an example of a uh, size limit that uh, went wrong, why is it important to uh, establish proper size limit, and why we need new data, and a little bit about uh, the data for stock technique uh, we're implementing here in Palau. And then uh, a little bit about the fisheries management reform that we're working on with fishermen. Next slide, please. So for many of you who follow conservation in Palau, you've come to understand that Palau has been very pro progressive in marine conservation over the last uh, 30 years. And this is because uh, uh, traditional conservation ethics and practices are rooted in how fishermen uh, were fishing in the past. Uh, in the 70s, when uh, Palau was trying to become a self-governing nation, uh, introduction of commercial fishing in the early 1980s uh, was introduced mainly by uh, Japanese government trying to have access uh, to Palau's uh, ESF for tuna fishing. And so they help provide uh, subsidies for development of uh, fisheries. And this led to a lot of a decline in uh, fish because uh, fishing practices, people were using dynamite, they were using nets, they were doing live reef fish trade. So there was a lot of concern in the 80s, and fishermen began to uh, talk about the need uh, to bring back the fish. And so in the 1990s, Palau began establishing marine protected areas and then focusing a little bit more on managing the reef and the fish. So today, over about 50% of Palau's marine environment is under some sort of management, either as a fully protected area or as a managed area or as a fishery zone. And in 1994, Palau passed a very comprehensive uh, Marine Protection Act that regulated a lot of the species that were uh, exploited. And even with this effort, fishermen still complain that fish continues to decline. Next slide, please. I'll use this example of uh, one of the provisions in the Palau Marine Protection Act that protected the uh, humphead parrot fish and Napoleon wrasse. In 1994, uh, the government worked with fishermen because there was, no, there was no data then to help them establish size limits, so they simply put a 25-inch size limit for both species. They felt like it was a good size of fish to eat, so they said, let's put a 25 in size limit. And what we know now today is uh, humphead part fish uh, start maturing at about 34 inches. So 
the size limit that was set then was way, way too low than the maturity level for this, this species. In addition, Palau uh, Kuravan and export for both species as well as established marine protected areas to protect both species. Next slide, please. You see on this slide, on the x-axis is the years, and on the y-axis is the weight in kilogram, and the red line is the fountain parrot, and the green line is the Napoleon rust. This is a market catch rate. It doesn't include the fish stock workout for subsistence. And as you see, beginning in 1990, they started collecting data, and fountain parrot has a, a higher catch rate than Napoleon rust. Then you see it fluctuates, but in a decreasing trend up until 2000. In 1998, uh, there was a massive bleaching event in Palau, and that big decline in humped rust may have been attributed to that. Nobody really knows. That's sort of what we think. And in 2000, uh, tourism picked up in Palau, and, as, and you can see that both species, harvest of both species, jumped up again. And then they continue to decline at about 2002 to 2003. The level of fishing pressure and how quickly both species can decline. And the decline continued up until 2006 when the fishermen continued to complain about the decline and the, the Congress finally put a ban on both species. So both species are currently under total ban, no take no harassment or anything. So that's why you see that in 2006, the catch rate stopped. Next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. So in this uh, slide, again on the y-axis is years and on the and the x-axis is years, and on the y-axis is the probability of encountering a Napoleon uh, humphead parrot fish. So in 2006, just prior to the uh, closure, if you went diving, you would see uh, one in every four dives, you will see one humphead parrot fish, or about 20% chance of encounter. Three years after the closure, that has increased to about 90% or almost every dive you see a half-head practice. So that's an indication that uh, they've increased in abundance. But the question remains, have they increased to a level where we can harvest them? Next slide, please. The, nat the Nature Conservancy worked with uh, a local research institution, uh, Palau International Coral Center, to con and the Palau Bureau of Marine Resources to conduct a staff assessment. And I'm not seeing. So, the, s the staff assessment was conducted. Uh, $50,000 for two species uh, based on density estimate. So uh, they surveyed about 80 sites across Palau uh, using underwater visual sensors and then they made estimate of what the stocks look like. And based on the assessment, uh, uh, the results show that there are just a little bit over 60,000 hundred parties and about 30,000 Napoleon rust. So the species after seven years of closure have not recovered to a level where it can be sustainably harvested. So the study recommends that the both species remain uh, closed up until we're able to determine uh, sustainable harvest level for them. So this is a comparison to a, a data poor stock technique which use 
such as the maturity to estimate spawning potential ratio, or SPR. So we don't really need to know how much fish is out there. We simply need to know how much spawning is occurring to be able to determine whether fishing pressure is too hard or too little so we can increase. And based on our estimate for implementing this technique, it costs about 10,000 uh, per species. And we have uh, 22 species of interest. And so this is roughly about $220,000 compared to about if we were to implement an underwater visual survey, probably would cost about a million, so about one twentieth of the cost. Next slide, please. So in this next slide, I'll explain a little bit about what uh, technique we're using. And we're using length to estimate size at maturity. So and the picture on the right is a picture of uh, Lieutenant Skibus or humpback snapper. And we simply work with fishermen to measure the length of their catch. In this case, this is uh, the humpback snapper. And we measure it uh, using fork length. And for other species, we use uh, uh, total length. So, once we measure the size of the fish, then we open the, the fish and we look at the gonads to determine whether it's a male or female and whether it's mature. Based on this data, we're able to then determine at what size does a specific species matures and therefore we can use that to calculate a required spawning potential ratio to maintain a healthy population. And so based on our results working with fishermen, it's showing that 61% uh, of the fish that are being captured from the fishery are immature or they have not had any chance to spawn before being captured. And then about 39% have reached maturity and I'll talk a little bit about within that 39% how much spawning is occurring. And I'm not seeing the next slide. And can you go on to, to the next slide? I finished uh, this slide already. Oh, you seeing that? Are you seeing it now, Felix? The the one with the graph and the three pictures. Yeah, can you go on to the next slide? Pass that one. Okay, okay. Here, here. So in this slide, uh, I'll show you uh, how we've determined a size at maturity for Luciano Skibus, or humpback snapper, and how a 20% uh, spotting potential ratio. Can you go back, please? So on the x-axis is the age in years and on the y-axis is length in inches and so for this particular species it can live up to about 13 years and then the blue line is the growth rate so it can reach at about uh, 16 inches uh, uh, maximum length so the number you're seeing on the on the graphs are uh, the first number is a current average of the size of fish that is being kept, captured in the fishery. So right now fishermen on average are catching about 10 inches of these species or at about two years old. Based on the data that we've collected, the species matures at 12 inches. So this species is being captured 2 inches less than the size at which it has matured or the size at which it can start breeding. And the next number which is 13 inches is the 20% spawning potential ratio or how much spawning is required for the species to maintain a stable population. So we're target we're targeting 20% as this has been um, 
uh, based on literature review, 20% uh, uh, is a recommended replacement level for fish. So let me explain a little bit about uh, what that means using uh, human population growth. Maybe a bit easier to explain. So if a man and wife have uh, two children, then they replace themselves because both children replace the parents. If they only have one, then the population decreases because there's, they cannot be all replaced. If they have more than two, then the population increases. So the 20% spawning potential ratio is similar to a man and wife having two kids. They replace themselves. So that's the minimum uh, spawning potential ratio that we are aiming to conserve in order to protect and ensure that fishing uh, continues and the population of a given species does not continue to decline. Next slide, please. So we've been able to assess 13 species and we have confidence in, we have enough data to confidently make predictions for seven species and I will show you two of the species on this slide. So on the left is the humpback snapper or we call it Permalan hearing fellow and it's doing only 5% of its natural spawning which is way below the 20% uh, minimum required to maintain a population. And based on the data that we've collected, if we close, if we put a ban on the harvest of these species within one year, it has reached the minimum required uh, uh, size, which is 13 inch. Right now it's 10 inch, so it can grow about 3 inch within a year. And it can attain a weight gain of about 170%. So within one year, fishermen can expect 170% increase in weight gain so they can catch less fish and make more profit. And on the right is the squirtail uh, grouper. And right now the species has been under seasonal closure since 1994. So from up until the beginning of this year, it was closed from April 1st to July 31st of each year. And then beginning of this year, that uh, seasonal closure got extended from April 1st to October 31st. Because even with the closure, the fish continued to decline. So while being protected, it has not been enough to protect the fish, particularly the size that is required to maintain minimum spawning potential ratio to replace itself. So the species is only doing 7% of its required spawning potential to maintain a population. And based on our estimate, we say within two years, if we close the species, it can reach uh, can attain a weight gain of about 300 percent. So the management approach we are recommending to fishermen is if you want a fast recovery, species closure for a given period of time is the best option, followed by implementation of size limits. If we implement just size limits now, given the circumstances of very weak enforcement, then the size limit would, would not really help recover the fishery. Next slide, please. So to conclude the presentation, uh, existing management strategies being applied in Palau and fisheries are not adequate enough to help recover the fisheries. We have a lot of marine protected areas. They have had uh, positive contribution to biodiversity and to fish within the confine of those uh, protected areas. They have not been enough to protect and contribute to fisheries beyond the borders of protected areas. The legislations in place 
are not being adequately enforced because of lack of enforcement and therefore they have not been enough to contribute to improvement in fisheries. What we know based on uh, our experience is if you put a balance species, it's the most effective and the fastest way to recovery. So if the goal is to recover the stocks to ensure uh, sustainable fishing in the future, we really need to entertain uh, working with fishermen and putting a ban on some species for a given period of time. And finally, spawning potential ratio using size estimate. It's a very fast way, cost effective, and it can easily be understood by fishermen. Fishermen have been working and cleaning their fish for a very long time, so it was very easy to work with fishermen to distinguish species from species and even to distinguish a male from female a fish and then to determine whether a gonad is mature or not. So we got data very quickly and very reliably from the fishermen using this technique. And that is the end of my presentation. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer any of them. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Stephen and Carmen. So uh, we'll move on to questions. So Stephen, the first question I have is for you um, from Chad Wiggins in Hawaii. And he had, was wondering, are the costs that you talked about per species uh, for the data core stock assessment annual costs or total costs? There's a total cost for assessment. Okay. So are you, so, sorry, go ahead. Depending on the depending on the time frame required to assess that stuff. So we've been uh, working with fishermen for the last two years, and the cost is about ten thousand. So that's ten thousand annually. We, we don't do it intensively, so we do it over a period of time. So if we do it intensively, we can still do it for ten k in a matter of three to six months. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to try to call on um, one of our participants, uh, David K. Has his hand up? Oh, he just sent it in. But David, if you want to ask your question and you have audio, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was uh, on, the, on the last webinar. Uh, the fellow pointed out that the, the main driver, if there's any one thing that would increase the health of a of a reef in the Caribbean, was having enough parrotfish. And the people are basically subsistence living these days on much of the islands. You can't really ask them to, to stop fishing parrotfish. Is there a way that we could farm parrotfish and add to the population? I don't know if uh, Carmen or Stephen have any expertise in that or want to go ahead and try to answer. Uh, I, I can try to answer that. Uh, I think from my understanding, uh, no part fish or, or maybe there is a species that has been cultured uh, and uh, since it, it, it is a herbivore we've had an experience uh, trying to capture a rabbit fish and still uh, at the very juvenile state it's very prob problematic to find the right uh, 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 food for it but once it reaches a certain size, then you can easily feed uh, the part fish with uh, algae. So, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any part fish that would uh, provide that grazing needed on the reef that has been captured. They've been trying to do that for uh, half-head part fish unsuccessfully. Great. Thanks, Stephen. All right. Another question, um, and I'll see if um, Gavin, if you want to ask a question, I've unmuted you. Hey, yeah, thank you. I was just <laughs> wondering, um, after you estimated SPR for your two species, it sounds like you made some forward projections on how the stocks would recover um, if the fishery is closed. Um, and I was just wondering how um, you modeled these projections. Okay, thanks, Stephen. 
Can you repeat the last part of the question? Sure, I'll repeat it. Um, his question was, after you estimated your SPR, you made some forward projections on how the two stocks would recover if the fishery was closed. How were those projections modeled, if they were modeled? Okay, so the, the science behind that, uh, I'm not quite familiar yet. Uh, but Dr. Jeremy Prince, who's been doing that, I think, so based on the current uh, uh, average size being captured, and based on the current, uh, uh, and based on its size of maturity, then we can estimate how many years uh, is required to reach a certain size. And so, if let's say for the Humpback snapper, it's currently 10 inches, it's required uh, uh, to reach 13 inches, then you simply, th th there's a mathematical way that it is calculated, and I'm not very familiar with that equation. Uh, so there's a way it is calculated based on uh, the current spawning potential ratio. Stephen, so if there were if there were people interested in how the future projections were modeled, um, would would we be able to get that from the researchers you mentioned that you were working with and right, share, right. That, share yeah. that? Okay, so mm -hmm. we can um, so this, we can share that. This technique is uh, this technique is still being developed, and so there's very few literature, and so we can't provide those literature to those who are interested. So um, I can follow up with you on that specific question, and when we send okay. out the follow-up to this webinar, we can um, maybe send out a little more information sure. on that. Okay, great. I have some other questions coming coming in as well. Um, this one's from Emily Fielding in Hawaii. Um, she wants to know what kind of staff expertise, um, I think you talked about funding, but time and resources do you need to start this type of assessment at, at for instance, example, one site in Hawaii. What, what does she need to start this kind of project? Um, that's her question. So the data collection is fairly simple, so any fisherman can do that. Fisherman who is able to identify and differentiate different species, able to uh, determine from the some of the fish, what is iguana and what is the intestine. So, and most fishermen can do that. The difficult and challenging part which requires a little bit more capacity is the analysis portion, which we are working with Dr. Jeremy Prince. And if you look at this picture, it's, he's the guy with the long hair. And he's the guy who's been working with other researchers in Australia trying to develop this technique. So a lot of it uh, requires liter literature research to get uh, life history parameters uh, available in the literature and using that to make modern predictions of spawning potential ratios. So the actual data collection is very simple. It's an analysis that's a little bit more, uh, require a lot more uh, scientific capacity and we can easily work with somebody who has that knowledge. And I think the data collection is the important part and require a lot of time, but can be done easily by fishermen. So am I hearing you say that you, I'll, you know, the methodology is, can be done with, like for instance in Hawaii, they could do this with the community members, but it would be good to be paired with some kind of researcher who, like you guys have done in your project, you've been paired with academic right. researchers, is that correct? Right. Right. You need somebody who understands and able to do the data analysis. The data collection is fairly simple. Okay. And sorry if I missed this, but what, how much time and resource, how much time did you put into this, these first ones? What was the time that you put into those? Just an estimate of the project timeline? So it really depends on what is uh, your objective. Our objective was to really build a relationship with fishermen as well as collect the data. So it has taken us two years 
However, if your objective is just to collect the data, you can do intensive sampling by being out there every day. And it can be done uh, within a matter of six months. So it really depends on how you're using this technique to engage with fishermen as well as collect the data. Okay, thanks. All right, um, there's another question. I'm going to call on Michaela. Um, if you have audio, I don't know if you'd like to ask your question, or I can go ahead and ask it as well. I see you're still muted, so I'll go ahead and ask. Um, so this question says, it's a, it's a couple parts, so maybe I'll ask the first part. For the, for the length-based size of maturity method, about how many samples length did you need to provide confident results? So that's the first part of the question. Okay. Can I answer that before you go to the second part? Yeah. So if you were to do it uh, based on just size class, so you specifically take uh, size classes of let's say 10 millimeter fish, you would need about 200 fish to be able to make that estimate. But because we're simply collecting uh, fishermen's cats, we've collected over 3,000 uh, data points over the last two years. But you really need just between two to 500 data points for specific species. So if you can get those data points that represent uh, different size class, then you're able to make that assessment. Michaela, I think you're unmuted now. Did you did you want to go ahead and ask the second part of your question, or did you have a follow-up for Stephen? Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, and thank you so much, Stephen. That was perfect. Uh, um, so the second part of my question was, I know you mentioned you assessed 13 species, and then you were able to have confident predictions of seven of the 13. So I was curious, like, what was the determining factor in being able to make confident predictions in those seven? Was it, you know, the number of data points or types of species? That was my okay. follow-up question. So the first part is the number of data points. So for the seven species, we have an uh, adequate number representing different size class. Because when we're working with fishermen, they target certain size. So it takes a while to get either the mature one or the smaller ones. And even with the, within a fishery where uh, the larger fish has been captured, it's difficult to uh, get the mature fish. So that's one uh, reason why we're only at 13. And the second part is some of these species don't have good life history information available in the literature, like natural growth rate, natural mortality, and all those kind of things. So, that's the second factor, and we have to use uh, closely similar species to make those estimates. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I have another question here that I wanted to um, ask from um, somebody on the line who doesn't have audio, but how do you implement a species ban in tropical multi-species fisheries where fishermen can't predict what species they will catch? That was that's the question. I, I couldn't hear the whole question. Can you repeat it? Yep. Mm -hmm. How do you implement a species ban in a tropical multi-species fishery where the fishermen can't predict what species they will catch? Petra, I still couldn't hear the last portion of the question. <laughs> okay. So it's in regards to, you know, you mentioned you guys are looking at species bans. And the question mm -hmm. was, how how is that done in multi-species fisheries where fishermen cannot necessarily predict what species they are going to be catching? Oh, okay. So that's true for... Uh, who can line for spearfishing? I think it's uh, easier because fishermen can distinguish a species from species. It's who can line that is a little bit problematic. But mm -hmm. what we've come to understand from who can line fishing is there are certain locations where fishermen catch certain species. 
So by telling, uh, by banning certain species, then we hope that they can selectively avoid those locations. And then the depth at which they're fishing are not too thick, but the fish can still be released and, and then survive. So it's true, yeah. Okay, thanks. And, and that's why we're uh, targeting fewer species so that it doesn't really affect uh, the fishermen's cats that much. Um, so another question is, was enforcement a part of this project yet, or how have the fishermen um, supported, or the people, how are people, you know, supporting enforcement of moving forward with this type of stuff? Oh no. Okay, I think we lost Stephen for a second, so I'll re-ask that question if he comes back. But um, I know, Carmen, you had some stuff that you wanted to add a little bit about the data for fisheries. Would you mind chatting about that now? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, to answer, I mean, when Stephen comes back, he can answer specifically for Palau, but I think for all our other projects, to answer the last question on enforcement, Enforcement is definitely an area where we're putting a lot of emphasis. So, I mean, Palau may be easier, <laughs> and when you have a smaller area where the community um, more or less can look at the area where you're fishing and keep control, that's easier. But in most of the other places, like in the working in Indonesia, we're definitely planning enforcement is a big problem and something that has to go hand in hand with Uh, I, and then the other, the other thing you want me to talk about, Petra, is the data for work from the science and nature working group. Is that correct? Yes, please. So yeah, just to let everybody know, we've um, we're, we've got a uh, one of the projects. I don't know if you're familiar with the science for nature and people working group. It's like the new MCs working group out of uh, University of Santa Barbara, and we received. Uh, one of the grants for a project to develop a framework for the different data post offices and methodologies so that you could, depending on the type of fishery uh, that you have, you could then use this framework to decide which method may be more applicable. So not always the SPR method is the one applicable for for some species. So there are plenty of other methods. So we're trying to develop this framework where you would have the different methodologies, the different fisheries archetypes, and then the different data sets that you would need for each so that it would give you a menu to select which is more appropriate for your fishery given you know, the resources you have or given the data availability you have. And we're hoping that all that work is going to be ready likely in a year and a half, maybe sooner. So we're very happy with that we're working together with a lot of the best scientists on, on this on the approach topsy. Hopefully that's something that we'll be also able to roll out in a format that you guys can use to the new percentage program. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carmen. I'm, I don't think Stephen's back online yet, so um, I'm not sure if you know specifically about the question on enforcement with the Palau project. Do you know if enforcement was a part of that project? I think it, what I understand, he was just doing an assessment at this, at this point. Do you no, and the Palau project is, so we started with the assessment and engaging the fishermen and then coming up with these target management of what percent of the violent we want to reach. Um, and then what we're doing now is we um, will then reach the administrative uh, units of the Northern Reefs and Palau is developing management plans for those fisheries which will include um, the bands, a little bit of alternative livelihoods because in some cases we do have to reduce effort and that's what is a challenge. So there's a lot of um, we're looking at feasibility for an alternative species to be excluded, and even some um, plant farming that they want to recover that they did some time ago and that's not working anymore. Um, 
and there is there is some part of enforcement working with the authorities, but that region may not. You know, a lot of the fishermen that are against fishing are part of this discussion, so it's a much easier enforcement. Kind of they help each other check. Uh, for other types of projects that are working, that is bigger area, larger area, there we are looking at enforcement. Hi, Petra. This is Stephen. Oh. I lost the uh, internet connection, <laughs> so I'm just styling it. Sorry. No, thanks, Stephen. Um, just we're, styled in now. You've done a great job coming back on. So I think we're getting near the point to wrap up, but um, okay. there's but there's one more question um, that I wanted to ask, or maybe two if we have time. Um, so has a species ban been put in place yet based on this analysis? Um, that was the question. Uh, it hasn't been put in place. We're trying to work with both fishing community. One community uh, would like to just put the ban in place right now. The other community, which, ha which has a lot more fishermen, uh, wants to put just size limits. So we're still negotiating with both communities to uh, come to some sort of a common understanding where uh, they would have similar management approach being applied to their water for ease of enforcement. So we're hoping our target was by end of this month we would have something. Uh, but I think we need to delay that for another month or two. And we continue to meet with fishermen. We have a meeting with them tonight on June 13 to try and sort of come up to some sort of agreement on what's the management approach that they would suppose uh, communities would need to implement. Okay, I think there's time for one more question uh, before we wrap up this webinar. And the, I know you spoke about how it was really fairly easy to engage the fishers and have them work on the data collection. Were there any specific challenges that you did not expect or things that you want people to be aware of if they are to work with fishermen on data collection? I think in terms of uh, working with fishermen, there was not a challenge. The challenge that took us by surprise is how fast they wanted to make changes. And we weren't prepared for uh, uh, that. We had hoped that these things would take, uh, uh, we were expecting things to be taking longer than what we anticipate. So this management, we were thinking about toward the end of the year, we would be starting discussing management. But as soon as they understood that why the fish started tickling and they said, so what can we do? So we were not very well prepared for uh, that challenge because we didn't really know then what needed to be done without having a good understanding of our data and what the circumstances are. So, And I think that was because this is a small fishing community. They have lived around this risk for a long time. They're very well bonded together fish, uh, fishermen. So. Engaging with them was fairly simple, and we didn't face a lot of challenges. The challenges was uh, could we respond quickly to what they had wanted to do in terms of implementing management. And then we wanted to slow it down because we wanted to uh, pace everything to ensure that what put in place is sustainable, not just taking this opportunity to do something without really thinking uh, how can this be sustainable in the long term. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Carmen, for the presentations and answering the questions. Um, we will follow up with all with everybody who was uh, here and those who registered with a recording of the webinar, as well as resource links, um, and we'll send that out after later this week. If you're not on okay. the Reef, Reef Resilience Network email list, so reefresilience.org, please sign up and send any suggestions to us for future webinar topics because we're always trying to figure out what managers need to know about. Um, so again, I wanted to thank Stephen and Carmen and thank everybody for participating. We, we hope you can join in our next webinar on June 10th. It's the second webinar in our series of three webinars to share information on the development of new tools and management strategies for coral reef fisheries. Um, look for that announcement with more details soon. So thanks, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you for hosting, and thanks, everyone, for listening.
and ask you questions. Thank you, Carmen.